Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Decarbonizing the Grid workshop series offered by uh, Stanford Bits and Watts. Today, um, we are uh, going to talk about coordinating demand side flexibility. And then on April 28, we'll have the last seminar in the, the, the last webinar on reaching 80% clean electricity by 2030. So I would like to welcome today our panelists. We're gonna have uh, Diane Greenwich from the Precourt, a Precourt Energy Scholar and the Schultz Stephenson Energy Policy Task Force uh, participant, Ram Narayanamurthy, a program manager in Advanced Buildings Research Program at the Electric Power Research in Institute, Fabio Genoese, a task force chair on demand side flexibility at ENSO E and head of strategy at Turna, and Gerda Dijong, issue manager system operations at Tenet. Um, our panelists cover the whole gamut from policy to buildings, um, system operator, and uh, uh, utilities uh, uh, operations. And uh, we will be discussing what does it take to scale up and integrate demand flexibility um, as a true resource in support of grid decarbonization. I'll give a brief introduction to the topic with, with some, you know, and some of you might be familiar but with what we are talking about. Um, and then uh, we will have the presenters each give a 15 minute presentation. So what are um, distributed energy resources? DRs refer to different types of small scale electric devices and appliances that can generate electricity such as rooftop solar, um, they can store electricity such as the uh, Tesla power wall and whose energy consumption can be flexibly reduced or shifted such as EV chargers, HVACs, water heaters and large industrial fans as shown here in the figure. Existing distributed, uh, existing decarbonization pathways identify renewable generation, DERs and energy efficiency uh, as very critical resources. It is predicted that global solar and wind energy penetration will rapidly increase from 2,300 terawatt hours in 2019 to 45,000 terawatt hours by 2050. DRs will represent a large and rapidly growing resource with 3,000 terawatt hours of distributed solar and storage by 2050, 1,290 terawatt hours of energy consumed by electric vehicles by 2040, and in addition, several hundreds of terawatt hours of flexible loads being added to the system. Energy efficiency is expected to be responsible for 40% of the emissions reductions. And we, we talk about energy efficiency measures, we're talking about adoption of better appliances and weatherization. How, how do DRs Im actually impact the grid? So DRs are located behind meters of electricity consumers such as homes, commercial buildings, and EV charging stations as shown here in the figure on the distribution network side of the grid. The electric grid was originally built such that electricity flows in one direction from large generators through the high voltage transmission network to the low voltage distribution networks where it's distributed to consumers. Voltage is stepped down through the network using several layers of transformers. The flow of ele electricity from generation to consumers is governed by a set of complex markets that ensure through pricing and contracts of different time scales that electricity supply always matches the demand and that the voltage and frequency stay within safe bounds throughout the whole network. Although the grid was the largest and most complex machine ever built, the one-way power flow and ability to schedule generators to provide predictable amounts of electricity made the operation robust and reliable. But this paradigm has been changing in two important ways, both have significant implications to the grid. 
The first is that the addition of utility scale wind and solar, which cannot be scheduled and are intermittent, complicates the operations of the grid. This is being offset somewhat by storage, particularly pumped hydro, and more recently, battery storage. The second change is that the excess power generated by DR resources, such as rooftop solar and storage, can be fed back into the grid, making the electricity flow in the grid two ways instead of one way. And it's important for us to understand how can this be utilized as a resource um, and managed to improve the integration of our renewables and the other uh, issues that, and, and to address the other issues that solve, uh, appear in our grid. DRs are mostly uncoordinated today. That is, they don't operate together towards explicitly optimizing consumer or grid objectives. There are some exceptions, however. One is that within some homes and commercial buildings with solar and storage, there's coordination to store the excess solar power and use it when electricity prices from the grid are high. Also, demand response programs run mostly by utility companies aim to control HVACs and other large electricity consuming devices to reduce peak demand in the grid. DR vendors also have private clouds for their own devices, such as for solar, storage, and EV chargers. However, these clouds are mostly used to collect data from the devices and to send software updates, but not really to coordinate or control the devices. But what do we mean when we talk about DR coordination? DR need, DRs need to be coordinated at two levels. One is behind the meter where resources at a single customer side are coordinated to meet local objectives and respond to global signals. And we can coordinate them across the meters where multiple customers are coordinated to provide services to the grid and reduce overall costs while ensuring distribution network safety and reliability. Across the meter coordinators optimize the system while meeting the net local network constraints. And typically, they should not depend on the knowledge of the intricacies of each customer if we want the solution to scale and to preserve privacy and security. But why do we need uh, this DR coordination? Here we have a graph that illustrates 30 days of demand, solar and wind generation data. You can see here in red is demand. Solar is in yellow and wind is in blue. You can notice that the renewable generation is intermittent. And more importantly, both sources of renewable don't necessarily perfectly correlate with the demand. DR coordination or demand flexibility can be utilized so that demand more, closes, more closely matches uh, renewable. So that's one big use of it. And in the other secondary use, we can also utilize flexible demands to handle the unpredictable changes that might happen in renewables. So for example, if you have a cloud passing by and there is a sudden drop in solar production, you can respond very quickly to those changes. Another place where uh, DR coordination is important is to handle the high EV penetration. So, in a program, in a flagship project of Bits and Watts uh, called the EV50, we investigate how does high EV penetration, 50% or more uh, electric vehicle, uh, vehicles becoming electric, how is that impacting the grid? So he, we can see here in the figure that by adding charging on top of the existing Kaizo load, assuming a 50% EV penetration here for the Bay Area, that's roughly 15 million vehicles, um, there is a grid power peak increase of 25%. This actually can cause significant overloading on the distribution system transformers and also uh, demands on the grid and the fleet of generation in the grid. In addition to that, fast charging can cause large low voltage spikes and large power spikes, sudden power spikes, which both can represent issues for the network voltage equipment at a distribution level and at the transmission level, uh, it can require a fast ramping of generators. So in both these cases that we saw, by coordinating DERs, we can prevent all of these issues. At Stanford, we have been looking at 
this problem of uh, DR coordination in several projects. PowerNet is one such project that was supported by the DOE and Bits and Watts, and it has researched and developed a coordination platform that leverages the cloud. In partnership with Google, Suntech Drive, and Sonen, we investigated how do we scale this coordination using the cloud. In order to scale it, we need to deal with four constraints. First, we need to handle all the local power grid constraints, the distribution network constraints. Second, we need to handle the cloud communication network constraints. So unlike is commonly believed, uh, from the cloud, you can't really do real-time feedback control. So there is some constraints on how frequently can you message if you want reliability. Be in addition to these two constraints in the system, we need to handle uh, user preferences because whenever you're doing coordination, you have to respect those preferences. And finally, um, you need to make it very easy to deploy and debug the system in the field in order to have the scalability of the deployment. The PowerNet architecture itself consists of two layers. At the, each customer, there is a local intelligence implemented in a local hub. This hub coordinates devices behind the meter for that customer. Uh, we investigated how to coordinate storage, EV charging, solar, and even a smart panel that was created at Stanford. Um, this hub communicates to the cloud that is then able to do calculations and interact with the hubs and provide the necessary information to protect the power network while achieving joint objectives, such as shaving the peak or providing services to the power market and so on. One of the um, key ideas in PowerNet is that the local hub and the cloud coordinator uh, they just ex exchange limited amounts of information. The local hub provides some aggregate information about its, its planned consumption and flexibility. And the cloud coordinator uh, does a day ahead calculation that then provides the local hubs with power bounds that they need to satisfy in order to protect the power network. In this way, we prove the issue of having to report individual information from every customer about each one of their devices and preferences to a potential coordinator. And that turned out to be really important when we went to implement PowerNet in practice. We have implemented PowerNet in several uh, places uh, in a lab uh, here at Stanford. Um, and we have two major test beds, one in Fremont with 35 homes and in a farm uh, where we manage the cooling of the farm. We have, been, we have shown that PowerNet can enable dramatic savings in terms of the bill of the customers. And we are now investigating how can we use PowerNet to provide grid services. So just to end my uh, portion of the presentation, what are the key challenges for scaling coordination of DERs? These are some of the questions we are hoping to update. First of all, you know, how do we in the regulatory framework to better support coordination? The one most critical policy limitants, how can energy efficiency become a grid resource and how do we ensure equity and fairness? Um, and I'm hoping Diane, you can address part of those questions. Second, how do we make it easy to scale this coordination? Particularly, how do we facilitate measurement and validation of you know, your responses to signals from the grid? How do we ensure an interoperability of devices and privacy and security in these systems? And Ram, uh, Ram Amurthy, I'm expecting you can address some of these issues. Um, and then finally, how do we integ integrate coordinated DRs in future grid operations? How to compensate participants, how to engage distribution system operators to ensure the distribution network constraints are met and that they also have an incentive to actually engage in coordination and what resources are actually reliable and cost-effective for grid needs. And Fabio and Gerda, I'm, I'm hoping you will address some of that. So finally, we'll have some discussions on, you know, what are the lessons learned? So just to kick off, here's our panelists. And Diane, you can uh, start, please. 
Great. So I'm Diane Grunick. I'm uh, a scholar researcher here at Stanford, but I also am a former policymaker. I've been in the policy world for over four decades now, and I was a commissioner with a state regulatory agency, the California Energy Commission, for six years from 2005 to 2010. So I'm delighted to be the person here that's talking really about the policy side as well as some of our organized wholesale markets. My focus is on the United States, but I know we have a couple of wonderful panelists who are also going to be able to talk about um, what's going on in Europe. Next slide. So I'm covering three topics, just quickly some policy basics, since I'm assuming um, many of you are not in the policy world. Second, um, focusing on some of our traditional energy efficiency, traditional demand response, EE and DR, and how they can be evolving. And then um, finally, really getting to the heart of what are the policy changes, what are the barriers, the changes we need to take advantage of demand flexibility as we're decarbonizing our grid. Next slide. So I'm going to get into policy real quickly. What do we mean by policy? This sometimes is confusing. There's one basic principle to keep in mind. Who makes policy? It's government. You have a lot of other people involved, but it really is government. And it's at the international level, the national level, the regional level, state and local. And then it consists of legislatures, chief executives like the president and the cabinet and agencies, and then the judicial side as well. And what they're doing is enacting laws, regulations, programs, really to try to get something to happen. Now we have our markets, regulated energy markets, the ISOs, the um, uh, MISO in the United States. Um, they are run by non-governmental entities, but they are regulated by the government. So they're a little bit of a hybrid. And here in the United States, it's a federal agency, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that regulates our wholesale markets. Next slide. So who creates US energy policy? Federal level, we've got Congress, primarily the US Department of Energy is involved, though we also have, as I said, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and then the Environmental Protection Agency. But President Biden has announced that for clean energy and climate, he wants an all of the government approach. So for example, our Department of Transportation is getting very involved in this area. At the state level, as I mentioned before, we have our legislators, our governors. Every state in the United States has something called the Public Utilities Commission, PUC, sometimes called the Public Service Commission. I was one of five members of the California PUC, and they regulate their investor-owned utilities. And then we also have state energy offices in every state in the United States. Here in California, it's the California Energy Commission and uh, various other state offices and agencies are involved in California. Again, our Air Resources Board is heavily involved in clean energy because they oversee the climate it, um, efforts. And then you've got city councils. So private entities are super important. They don't make policy, but they sure do influence how it gets made, what is done, and then very involved on the implementation. So that's a sense of policy is really complex in terms of who's involved and who does what, at least in the United States. And I think this is true for many, if not most places around the world. Next slide. So real quickly, there's three major policy tools that are used everywhere. The first are carrots. That's the money. It can be direct grants, but it can be indirect expedited permitting. The second are our sticks. These are mandates. These are requirements. A typical one uh, could be the renewable portfolio standard, a requirement that utilities build a certain amount of renewables or procure it. And then third are what we call sermons, basically getting people, businesses to change behaviors to understand what's available. And in my experience, the best policy programs use all three of these in an integrated and longer term fashion. Next slide. So let's move on very quickly now to our traditional demand side tools that Ram alluded to. 
And just real quickly, so we're all on the same page, the difference between energy efficiency and demand response. Energy efficiency is providing the same service, but requiring less input energy or providing more service with the same amount. So you're basically having less energy used for a given service at any time. Demand response is different. What it is doing is thinking about whatever is the load, I'll take it say within a building um, from a device and trying to get a change in the normal consumption pattern. And this can be done through prices, it can be done through technology, and it may result in less service and it may not reduce the overall consumption. So it's less energy used in a particular time. Energy efficiency is traditionally less energy used at any time. Next slide. I thought it would be good for those of you not deep into energy efficiency, just understand what our basic tools are. And this comes from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ACEEE. Um, our uh, uh, mandate on vehicle fuel economy standards is actually the single most important um, tool that we have in the United States. It unfortunately has been slowed down under our prior administration, um, but everybody is ready to go full speed ahead as well right now. And then you see listed here are other major tools that we have in the energy efficiency world, our appliance standards, our building codes, uh, Energy Star, utility efficiency programs, federal R&D. Collectively, these policies have reduced US energy usage by about, they, in 2017, they reduced our energy usage by about 20%, saving 25 quads of energy. That was the amount used equivalent that year for California, Texas, and Florida. So I wanna reemphasize what Rom said. Um, when we are thinking about decarbonizing the grid, energy efficiency is our friend. It's our friendliest friend. It is very effective and it has done a great job so far, but we can do more in this area. Um, but I really want, hope everybody as they're thinking about decarbonizing the grid, it is not immediately just let's go to storage or let's go to something else. It is thinking fundamentally, how can we make our buildings, our industries, our cars more efficient? Because that then means there's less work that the supply side, that the grid has to do. And that's fundamentally what we're trying to do with energy efficiency. On top of it, it generally saves money as well. So next slide. Um, we can do more though with energy efficiency. In 2014, I co-wrote a paper for the Electricity Journal. It is available. I uh, wrote it with David Jaco, who is head of energy efficiency at our largest municipal utility in the United States, um, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And it really tried to talk about there's a future in energy efficiency beyond what we've done where we can use data in a way we haven't, we can understand operational uses in building. And very importantly, we raise the idea that we can value energy efficiency if we focus on location and grid integration. So I encourage any of you who want to look at this, it was um, a really fun paper to write as well. Next slide. Then um, the next year in 2015, I wrote another paper that was on called the next level of energy efficiency, five challenges ahead. I don't have time to go into this, but one of the challenges that we talked about specifically was how do we value energy efficiency? So it really is focused on providing both locational and temporal um, benefits to the grid. And that's something that we're just beginning to think about for energy efficiency. Next slide. And sorry, I'm moving so quickly through everything, but we wanna get into it. Um, this is a quick overview that the FERC staff published in December um, that gives you a sense of where we are with demand response. Remember, I just finished energy efficiency demand response and it's 2013 through 2018. The point I wanna get across is we haven't seen really significant jumps in the use of demand response over this time period. And this is one of the opportunities as well as challenges we have ahead. Next slide. 
I was asked to talk about FERC, so I'm not gonna go through this. You'll all have the slides, but basically FERC has been working on how to bring in DERs and demand response at the wholesale federal level. And they started in 2008 where they really wanted the ISO RTOs to integrate demand response, but it's worked its way through the courts and everything else all the way down to a major order that was issued in September of last year called FERC Order 2222. And it is basically our ISOs and RTOs must remove barriers to participation by the DER aggregators in wholesale markets. They must file tariffs to do so. There was concern that it had an emphasize made clear demand response needs to be a participant and a resource offered by aggregators. And so we just had a new order that came out last month, 222A, that clarifies that state regulators who have a host of concerns in this area, we won't go into it, but they can't block DER participation in wholesale markets just because demand response is included. And this we hope is really going to be a groundbreaker of bringing up our wholesale markets. This is an example of a policy change. Next slide. So now I'm doing my whirlwind tour of policy on uh, demand flexibility. I think that uh, Ram went through this, so I won't repeat it other than to say, my focus as a former policymaker includes a great deal on the buildings themselves. This is where we can get our efficiency, but this is where we have the host of our basically um, devices that use electricity that can then shape and shift and modulate their load so they can be a friend to the um, grid. There's a great paper that came out from two um, state trade organizations, NASIO and Nehruk in October 9, 2019 on the benefits of these grid interactive efficient buildings. And again, Rom went through most of them. We can integrate our renewables. We can really lower costs. We can reduce emissions and they can provide grid services. So from the policy side, this is what we look at. These are the benefits. How do we get the policies to correspond? Next slide. So what are the barriers? And I tried to actually limit them and make them big picture enough so that people could get a sense of the magnitude as well as the focus. The first thing is there's really a lack of knowledge about this whole area by utilities, regulators, stakeholders. There's some deep in the knowledge, but I'd say overall very, very little knowledge. And that is combined with there's a culture, a very strong culture by both regulators and utilities of being risk adverse. So you put that two together and that is a blueprint for inaction. So this is a barrier we've got to understand and address. Second one is historic silos within utilities, state agencies, state versus federal. Um, the demand side within a utility is often on the customer service side, a totally different group that's working on generation or transmission or distribution. And so even having those people get to know each other, that's the same within state agencies, within state PUCs. And then in the world we're talking about, the expertise in buildings, the expertise in um, transportation, that isn't anywhere near a traditional public utilities commission who is the state regulator in this area. State versus federal is also very, very different. Um, I won't go into it, but the bottom line is we don't have a federal energy policy. We don't have a clean energy policy. We don't have a climate policy. So we have just a lot of fluctuation of what may be the emphasis at the state level, at the federal level. Money, money, money is my third. This is going to be an expensive transformation, trillions of dollars. And we don't have any good funding sources now that are focused on this. The solution is not going to be, we're gonna raise rates because that's not gonna have the type of transformation we need to do. And even at the federal level with wholesale markets is fairly not gonna be large enough. Uh, the fourth is customer rate structures as well as wholesale tariffs. If customers are on flat rates, which is true for many, many areas, um, they are not incentivized to change their usage to when perhaps the grid needs it. So we have to make major changes in, in rates. 
Um, the next one that I uh, know others are going to talk about is we don't have any accepted valuation or performance metrics. And for regulators, as well as utilities, that's death for going into this area because they want to be able to forecast what are savings, what are benefits. And then you have to be able to look back and say, was that achieved? Um, and then just overall, we haven't yet developed our regulatory um, and market structures to enable the type of aggregation we need, uh, really pricing I mentioned, and trading. So all of these are the biggest barriers that I see. Now, here's my last slide. What can we do? So I think that um, I just, this is my view. I think we need a very strong shared federal and state commitment to develop demand flexibility for the decarbonized grid. We have a lot of folks that have goals on decarbonizing the grid, but I have yet to see any policy making entities say flexible, demand flexibility is a goal we are going to achieve. Second is I think we need something like 25 year action plans at both the state and national level for how we are going to develop large scale demand flexibility, starting and including year by year goals and implementation steps, because we're not going to get there in 25 years at the pace we're doing now. Third, I would love to see a federal Marshall Plan providing the majority of the 10 year seed funding for making this happen. The way we are going about it now will not work. We're not gonna have enough rate increases. And we're not gonna have enough private investment. If we're gonna get the benefits of this, I think we need a very strong federal push. Then we need to really have a major effort on what are those business models programs that will provide adequate compensation. Customers need to understand what money they'll get Utilities and aggregators also need to understand it. Again, this needs to be done in a very comprehensive, large scale thinking. Um, the next one, as I mentioned, is our regulatory market structures. We've got small pilot programs going on, but that is radically different from a grid that is decarbonized that can use this type of resource. And so there's all sorts of things that need to be done on new performance metrics. I'm very excited about being able to use automated analytics to create our baselines and for forecast performance. A lot of work in those areas. And then um, the last one is adoption of new customer rate structures. This includes getting our smart meters much more pervasive than they are now. And it's going to be a major shift at every state level to make this happen. Um, let me conclude with an item that Rom raised, which is equity. Um, I hope I've come across, this is not gonna be cheap. It may end up having benefits, certainly for the climate, we need to spend this money, but we have to be very conscious if we're going to have it for our lower income communities who are often in multifamily buildings. There are a host of traditional problems with efficiency in those buildings. And frankly, we can do it, but it's going to be expensive. And we're gonna to have to think very consciously, how are we bringing in all of our communities in this area? So that's it. Um, my sum is it's big challenges, it's big changes ahead on the policy side, but I think it is doable and I think we can get some great results. Thank you. Diane, uh, thank you very much. Um, I was going to have a question for you exactly about equity, <laughs> but maybe we can uh, keep it for the moderation, uh, moderated part of the session. So now, uh, Ram, uh, could you please uh, start uh, your presentation? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ram, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, so, Diane, that was a great, that was a great intro, and um, I will, um, pro I will try to um, address something that's close to me, which is the whole concept of energy efficiency and its role in demand flexibility. And then we'll also talk a little bit more about what Ram was looking for, which is a, what are the gaps uh, in, in the implementation, the hows, the data platform, so we can dive into those too. So um, as we think about uh, demand flexibility, I think this is something that's been um, core to EPRI's mission for many, many years. Um, I still think about the fact that uh, like Clark Gellings, who's been working on this for about 40 years, started the whole practice of in, uh, integrated demand side management. And for those of you who are not aware of EPRI, um, EPRI is a um, 
public benefit nonprofit organization. Uh, we're focused on advancing safe, reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible electricity. And a lot of our work goes end to end. It's it's all the way from the generation side, all the way to how um, energy is used in with customers and buildings. But one of the things that um, I've personally been focused on, and this is uh, something we can dive into a lot more too, is when we look at the building stock, and we know that we have to decarbonize our building stock. Um, the general consensus is, hey, we are going to decarbonize the grid. The grid's going to be carbon free by 2050, pretty much in every place. Then all you have to do is just electrify the buildings and voila, right? You're there in terms of building decarbonization. But one of the things that we want to really look at in terms of the building decarbonization strategy is how do you integrate um, energy efficiency, customer renewables, um, even things like low carbon fuels, and how do you put them together within the building stock? And what is the role of demand flexibility in being able to advance this vision of not just a zero carbon grid, but a zero carbon economy? And so when we look at it from that perspective, while we talk about decarbonization, or oh, sorry, demand flexibility as a decarbonization strategy for, from a building's perspective, they are driven by different targets. So in some places where you have clean energy generation targets, where you have the target for the grid to be decarbonized, that drives your flexibility requirements from buildings because you're looking at more renewables on the grid. You're looking at how can you actually flex your demand so that we can meet our load, uh, sorry, meet our supply. But then when we look at the other side, which is the economy-wide decarbonization, we are driving towards reducing the carbon content in buildings. One way to do that is, of course, through flexibility in buildings, but then energy efficiency is a very critical part of this low carbon pathway. Um, electrification is more and more a important and a critical part of this decarbonization strategy. And then we also start looking at other things like embodied carbon in buildings. How do you reduce the carbon content in concrete, uh, new construction methods, et cetera. And then finally, what is the role of low carbon fuels? Low carbon fuels can play a role in both decarbonizing your building stock from the heating side, but they can also play a role in terms of um, providing flexibility um, through possibly dual fuel strategies. So these are all different elements of our decarbonization pathway. And so as we work, work towards this demand flexibility, I think it's key to keep in mind that all of these different strategies are going to help us with uh, attaining the de demand flexibility that we need. So when we think about these pathways to decarbonization and think about how we integrate demand flexibility, um, Diane mentioned it quite a few times too, which is the economics are important. The customer economics are important. So as I go through this, right, I want to focus on some of the areas of demand flexibility that we don't normally associate with demand response or controls, right? Um, so for example, what is the role of the customer? What are they willing to accept in terms of providing flexibility services? Um, what is the role of the distribution planning? So all of these come factor in together when we look at demand flexibility as one of the um, cogs in the wheel in being able to attain our uh, low carbon future. So when we think about how do we get to that zero carbon future, there are many strategies that customers can take. For example, some customers might say, hey, I know that the grid's gonna be carbon free or I'm going to generate my own, um, um, own renewable generation. So I'm going to do electrification and then apply demand flexibility and I'm on my pathways to zero, pathway to zero carbon. Other customers might say, hey, I'm going to do what is available today, what is economic, Maybe it's some energy efficiency, maybe it's some demand response, but then I'm going to wait for new technologies to come. So, but as, but in each of these individual pathways, there's a role for demand flexibility. And the other thing is that demand flexibility can also provide resilience to customers. Um, it can provide customer optionality and ultimately reduce costs for the customers. So this is again, what it goes back to is that when we talk about demand flexibility as a, um, as a big picture umbrella, it's not just about controls. Um, energy efficiency is a very critical part of demand flexibility. Um, one example, let's say we are replacing um, um, electric water heaters with heat pump water heaters. Yes, heat pump water heaters can also provide demand flexibility, 
um, maybe not even as much as electric water heaters. Maybe an electric water heater can provide 1 kW of demand response. Keep the water heaters might provide you 0.2 kW per building. But overall, the reduction in demand would be more closer to the order of 3 to 4 kilowatts because they're running much more efficiently. So the impact to the grid from this energy efficiency measure is actually higher than what you would get with just a pure controls based operation. Um, distribution planning, as we look at electrification, it's becoming pretty apparent that one of the big barriers to electrification in our existing building stock is going to be the readiness and the capability of the edge of the grid distribution networks to be able to accept these electrified loads. Um, so from that perspective, having demand flexibility could potentially be quite useful and helpful in avoiding distribution upgrades. Um, customer energy management and resilience. Um, demand flexibility is as we get more time variable rates, um, the customer energy management becomes a lot more important. And in a way, it also can provide resilience. So for example, if you're thinking about demand flexibility and the fact that, hey, we can have better insulated buildings to provide more demand flexibility, that same insulation can also act as a weather resilience. So that way your home is not getting as cold or as hot as you see more weather extremes. So these are all other benefits, other applications of demand flexibility that we tend not to focus on as much. Um, there's, there's a, the, the word demand flexibility seems to trigger in, in most of us, just this impression of controls and controls based operation. We will get to that too. But I think it's important that we look at this in a very holistic manner, looking at how it enables all these other benefits and the benefit streams. And so when we think of our future planning, right, these are all things that have to be incorporated. So as an example, um, at APRI, we have run a series of um, um, large scale demonstrations um, in, in smart communities, looking at how this confluence of um, uh, customer renewables, energy storage, demand response, energy efficiency, electrification, how all of it comes together to be able to enable a future grid. So within that, there's all these different flavors. There is a lot of focus on um, affordable housing. How do you build new affordable housing better? How do you electrify it? How do you get to zero carbon housing? How do you do community microgrids? How do they actually operate? Where do you connect them? If you do a community microgrid, how do you actually provide that resilience to the customers? Um, there is work going on. One of the other um, instances is uh, there is large scale pilots uh, looking at smart thermostat deployments across the country. And part of what you find there is uh, what is the aggregate um, availability of demand, but also um, the, the whole data stream how do you use data from end use devices for MNV? How do you um, how do you connect these um, connect these different databases together? How do you actually send the signals? How do you get them MNV coming back? So there's all these different aspects that come out as you do these large scale demonstrations. And so there's some very interesting lessons learned um, on on demand flexibility, and then you build on top of those lessons learned to figure out how to do the next step. For example, if you're doing a community microgrid in a multifamily affordable housing community, um, it's kind of interesting that the way our policy um, is set up with virtual net metering for the community renewables, it, 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 the, the interconnections don't allow us to provide backup power to, these, um, to the uh, tenants in those housing communities because of the way the electrical connections are set. So these are things that show up when you actually do these demonstrations. For demand flexibility. So take a couple of examples and what we have learned. Um, and this again, going back to this concept of this integration of energy efficiency and demand response. Um, in this example, this is actually a uh, 60 home um, affordable housing community that we looked at from the viewpoint of how do you get an existing 50 year old poorly insulated community to a zero carbon community through electrification. So this community, for instance, had all the elements, all the DER elements, right? Uh, there is a 137 kW uh, community solar um, array. There is um, um, 
we, we, we were able to go in and insulate all the building walls working with the local utilities customer programs. Um, we were able to go in and uh, change out the heating systems. So um, as we go through these different steps, you learn a lot of different things. One big learning that came out is that while we think of electrification as a technically feasible pathway today or a more direct pathway to get to um, our low carbon future, um, a big challenge was that the available products um, do not really fit into the spaces that are there. But also more importantly, that the electric grid infrastructure is not sized for electrification of these heating systems. So then you go through the fact that the cost of getting these electrification upgrades was mostly on the grid side. It's not on the customer side. But the fact is that edge of the grid upgrades show up as a customer cost. So when, then you look at how do you actually apply demand flexibility strategies so that you can reduce billions of dollars in customer cost. If we were to, the, the results that we, that we that came out of the um, pilot showed that we were sitting around fifteen twenty thousand dollars per apartment to get them electrified. So what do you do? Then you look at new technologies that can enable demand flexibility, which is lowering the total demand from these buildings while still being able to electrify and decarbonize these buildings. So that leads you to technologies like um, highly efficient uh, heat pumps that that uh, pull very low energy. Right. Smart panels, for example, smart panels that can help with balancing loads so the, so that your um, your cooking um, cooking equipment is not running at the same time as your heat pump is. How do you balance those loads so that you're not hitting the cap on the distribution side, which then triggers further distribution upgrades. Um, thermal storage in, 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 in the form of uh, community scale water heating systems. Because what we found was that, for example, is that if you put in a water heater in every unit, you're looking at 250 kilowatts of demand for 60 units, for 60 apartments. Whereas if we are able to put a community storage unit uh, or a community water heating system, you can take that 250 kilowatts of demand and bring it down to 50 kilowatts. So there's all these different energy efficiency or integrated demand side management technologies that can substantially help in being able to move down the pathway of decarbonization by being able to manage your demand more effectively. Um, another example, um, about three, four years ago, we've uh, completed a demonstration. It was the first demonstration of uh, zero net energy communities in California. And one of the big outcomes there was that the a big concern going in was that the local utilities had to change their distribution planning practices because now your net demand when you electrified your systems and you added battery storage in these buildings um, was that the net demand was going to go from 10 kW to about 25 kilowatts per home, which meant that you had to upsize your transformers, upsize your wiring, et cetera. But because we were able to in, uh, implement very high energy efficiency uh, through better building envelopes, um, uh, through better equipment, more efficient equipment, one of the big findings there was that this, the, the role of energy efficiency in providing demand flexibility was that we could, for example, if a transformer had 10 homes on a single circuit, the actual coincident peak load was only about a factor of 0.45 versus the normal factor of 0.75. That is, you could actually, um, the, the, the net load was about 40% lower than what was expected by standard planning methodologies because we were able to implement energy efficiency in these buildings. So these are all some really good examples of how we approach, how to approach demand flexibility, not just from, hey, let's put all this equipment in and control them to a more planned um, program that inc incorporates energy efficiency and energy efficiency in congruence with uh, local renewables and demand flexibility. Um, I will jump a little bit into the how, um, which is this whole concept of, yes, we have all these technologies. Now, how do we implement them? How do we get the MNV? And the more important question of data platforms that can help us um, understand demand flexibility. And Ram mentioned, uh, talked a lot about the uh, PowerNet platform. Um, so um, an example of those kinds of implementations is, I think there's a lot of learning we have to do with regards to the aggregation of customer resources. So one of, the, um, one of the efforts that we've been looking at is 
how do you create this uh, kind of a unifying platform which can be really used to understand how individual resources work, whether that's a Nest thermostat or an Ecobee thermostat, a Sonnen or a Tesla Powerwall for battery storage. It could be a Sandin um, heat, uh, water heating system. How do all these different individual components work, work together to provide the demand flexibility? It's almost a way of trying to understand aggregation from the bottom up. So uh, one effort we, um, uh, we worked on was actually trying to put together this data platform by which we can actually get the data from each of these individual devices, but also provide a rate engine by which we can send time variable rates to these devices and observe how they actually operate. Um, so within that, um, a big part of the work was actually creating this da data platform, which leads to the functional specifications of how each of these end use devices should work. So part of this is creating multi-layer um, multi architecture by which you can take all the way from a utility or even from an ISO level, all the way to the end use devices, and then bringing back the data and transparency so that you know what works, what doesn't work and where the gaps are. So in this case, there is four layers. One is a utility layer that's consistent with signaling. It uses OpenADR 2.0B. Then there is a data aggregation and abstraction layer that provides all the MNV functions. There's an orchestration layer because now you're trying to connect across so many different um, end use devices and systems. And then finally, a participant layer. We cannot forget the role of the customer as we work through demand flexibility. So how do you provide services to the customer that enables them and that makes them be a part of the solution for demand flexibility? So um, first application, rate-based demand response. Here we were, um, what we did was we used this data platform to be able to send signals to a commercial building and manage the thermostats and uh, some of the plug loads and also provided an app to the end customers so that they can actually look at their, um, look at their energy use and rates and, and, and uh, work with them on the uh, uh, engagement for the demand. And um, so this was something that was tested in uh, buildings in California and New York. Um, second example is how do you use the same architecture to be able to connect to a fleet of electric vehicles and this can be done through APIs or through other, um, other communication pathways to uh, both heavy duty as well as light duty uh, EVs. So there are multiple um, applications that can be used um, for understanding demand flexibility. And finally, so what are the takeaways, right? For, so in the context of decarbonization, I think it's really important for us to recognize the importance of energy efficiency in providing demand flexibility. And we also have to understand that as we try to decarbonize our building stock, uh, the distribution systems, um, the cost in the distribution systems could be quite substantial and that the demand flexibility would have uh, and should have a significant role in being able to offset the cost in the distribution upgrades. And finally, we have to be able to cross this business model barrier for aggregation. One of the big challenges with aggregation is each aggregation is a single business to business transaction and how do you actually overcome those business model barriers for aggregation? So with that, I will hand it back to Ram and uh, thank you again um, for the opportunity. Hi Ram, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will go to our next speaker um, and panelist. Uh, please Fabio, um, you can uh, take over from here. So hello from my side. Um, um, and good evening actually, it's uh, 6 p.m. In, in Rome, Italy right now. Um, first of all, let me thank you for the very kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to speak at Stanford University. My name is uh, Fabio Genoese. I'm heading the strategy team at Terna, the Italian um, system operator. The Italian power system, I would say, is somewhat similar to the Californian ones, roughly 300 terawatt hours of electricity consumption, the peak of 60 gigawatt, which occurs in, in summer caused by air conditioning, just like in, in California. There are quite some similarities, I would say, between Italy and California in terms of size, although regulation policy tends to be very different between the, the two areas. Um, today, actually, I'm speaking on behalf of NSOE, that is the European Association of Transmission System Operators, in my role as task force chair on demand side flexibility. Um, NSOE, which covers the European grid, as you can see a bit in the background, uh, that's a European continental grid, which connects um, Poland to 
Portugal, Denmark to Italy or Belgium to, to Greece. It's an interconnected, synchronized grid all over the continent, being that we have the same frequency all over the place. Okay, I thought it would be good to, to give you a bit of context um, in terms of uh, current energy scenarios. Um, for Europe, um, the European Union has a net zero greenhouse gas emission target for 2050, which means it is a, there's a growing role of the power sector. Typically, when you talk about net zero scenarios, you, you have two mega trends, which is first, um, the electrification of total energy consumption, and second, a growing role of the power sector. You can see it a bit on the right side. Today, we are in Europe at 34% renewables across the EU27 with a total electricity demand of almost 3,000 terawatt hours. And according to, to our plans, the, the share of renewables will grow to towards 65% within the next 10 years and probably above 85% within the next 30 years. It's part of our Green Deal and Net Zero targets. In parallel, we have a massive growth of electricity demand, um, while overall energy demand will have to decrease. Uh, I think that's the beauty of electricity. You can cover the same needs, be it uh, cars or, or heating of, of buildings, as Ram was saying, at a lower primary energy demand if you use electricity instead of gas, for instance, uh, when it comes to, to heating your home. Now for us, um, system operators, this means typically three challenges. I only listed the, the main ones. Um, it, it, when you transform the power system in this magnitude, you typically will have the problem of uh, lack of traditional resources that we as system operators use today um, to balance the grid, um, to provide grid ancillary services, as, as we typically say. We also expect that the electricity demand profile will be much more volatile because you have millions of electric cars and heat pumps in the system. And uh, let's be honest, we do not know yet how they will behave. And on top of that, at climate change, we expect an increasing peak electricity usage due to uh, climate change and uh, air conditioning, of course. And how should we handle this? Um, first, maybe to give you a quantitative insight, not for 2050, but for 2030, that's nine years from now. Um, if you look at the uh, left graph, you see, uh, let's say, the hourly ramps of the residual load of the net load for continental Europe. Residual load would be the total load net of renewables like wind, solar, hydro, things like that. As you can see, um, we expect extreme events already by 2030. It can happen that from one hour to another, I need to ramp up by 60 gigawatts. To put things a bit into perspective, that is as if I would switch on the whole of Italy or the whole of California from one hour to another. Um, this is beyond anything we have ever observed. And um, to be honest, also, it, it's not clear how we should handle this. Um, the big question, of course, is we don't know how to handle it today, uh, but how would we do it tomorrow in the absence of big power plants, which were built just to follow demand, but we will, which we will not have in 10 years from now? Part of the solution we think will be the flexible distributed resources. And this is shown on the right-hand side. For 2030, we expect <clears throat> roughly 120 million electric vehicles in, in Europe. That's a bit less than half of the passenger car fleet uh, today. So half of, a bit less than half of it is expected to be electric. So what is the flexibility potential of this fleet? Let's imagine that they charge with an average seven kilowatts, it's rather slow, and that's roughly 10% of them are charging at the same time and are available to be cut off or shifted for an hour. You end up with a flexibility potential of 87 gigawatt, right? You can see that this is comparable to the maximum hourly ramp that we observe. So it's simply too good to be ignored. It's the same order of magnitude as the extreme events. So how do you unlock this potential? We are a system of operators keen on unlocking this potential uh, as I think uh, this is we, we stress this we we don't see this as a as a threat but rather as an opportunity because this is flexibility and it comes on board of on of new devices how to unlock it so I think here um, 
coordination is, is the key word and, and Gerda will follow up on this a, a bit later. I'm only giving you the, the high level overview of coordination. Coordination is important across the whole value chain. It's important first because distributed resources tend to be very small compared to the traditional flexibility resources. Hence, you will require aggregation to reach significance and have statistics on your side. Second, these new resources will be located mainly in low voltage networks, take EVs, charging points will mostly be located in cities or, or uh, next to buildings, only a fraction of them will be on highways. Take renewables, we expect that up to 50% of all new solar could be rooftop and thus be connected to distribution networks. This is stuff that we as transmission system operators typically do not see individually and let alone dispatch it individually. But as I uh, shown you on the first slide, this is stuff we need to move also to stabilize the system. So this means that as a transmission system operator, given that these are very small resources, I would likely want to activate at least a few thousand electric vehicles at once in order to reach a significant measurable effect at transmission level. Imagine these two, 3,000 electric vehicles that I want to activate would all be located in the same city district of Rome, close to the Colosseum. Yeah, and it, clearly this, this could easily overload the local network and send a whole city district to darkness. This is why coordination with the distribution network operators is, is fundamental. A third layer of complexity is introduced because these assets can probably provide different types of services, as you can see in the middle. They could provide frequency control, congestion management, voltage control. And the key question here is, can one single dispatch order solve both a voltage control problem and in the city of Rome and uh, contribute to frequency stability at national or transmission level? Probably yes, but we do not know yet how to organize and um, yeah, unlock such a dual use dispatch command yet. Because as transmission system operators, typically I don't have the knowledge of what is happening, what is going on at distribution side and, and what are the effects of my activities. Let's focus a bit on demand, um, which for us as system operators, I would say is pretty technology agnostic. So it can be anything from small scale like electric vehicles, heat pumps to large scale resources like electrolyzers, industrial load, power to gas, you name it. For demand side flexibility, what we do, however, think is useful to distinguish between implicit and explicit demand side flexibility. Implicit demand side flexibility for us means that consumers react to price signals. For instance, you have a critical peak pricing program in, in most US states. It is a voluntary adaption of load to save on energy expenses. Minimum technical requirement here includes that you need to be able to meter your withdrawal to off electricity from the grid in certain time intervals, let's say every 15 minutes. This is needed for financial settlement. So there are some barriers to, to overcome, especially for small scale resource. These barriers, for instance, can be technical because interval meters or small me smart meters, they are not yet available to all types of customers because the rollout started with larger consumers. Another barrier can be behavioral. The adaptation of load through personal choice can be cumbersome. We all know that it uh, can be cumbersome to decide to put on your washing machine uh, in a certain hour instead of the other. But I would also say there's an economic barrier because the adaptation of load through automation makes it less cumbersome, but at, as, at least in the past was not cost effective for all solutions. Overall, I would say that the current technology and software solutions, they can easily overcome these barriers. Just think of, of the last electric appliance you bought, Wi-Fi and home automation is everywhere. It has been become so ridiculously cheap to remote control devices based on algorithms and external inputs that Personally, we think that this is an easy thing. Of course, let's say on the regulatory side, you, you probably some, need somebody who defines a dynamic price that reflects the, the state of the grid. And we in Europe, at least, we are convinced that a competitive retail market is a good basis to provide dynamic price signals to customers. Let's move on to explicit demand side flexibility. Explicit means for us that system operators can request a certain behavior to stabilize the grid. And of course, we must be sure that it is delivered. So it's not an expectation, it's not a voluntary thing. It's something that we can, with a switch, turn off and on. A bit like today, we are moving power plants. We're ramping up and ramping down power plants all the way, all the time today to stabilize the grid. 
for this reason, of course, the minimum technical requirements are a bit more stringent. Uh, we typically require real-time telemetry, which is every four seconds you send the state. And we also require remote management capability that we can trust. So it's not uh, a Wi-Fi chip that some device manufacturer has decided to, to put it into his device. It must, of course, respond to certain reliability standards so that we can trust the signal and the capability that is coming with this type of device. Entry barriers, I would say, are a bit more complex in this case, because as I say, you are providing something to a system operator. A system operator sees megawatt, he doesn't see kilowatt. So you need to manage a large number of resources. There's an organizational barrier, I would say. Uh, typically, you also have an economical barrier because there's a higher cost per megawatt for real-time telemetry remote control capability. It's it's a one-off cost. And if you have to put the one-off cost in every heater, it's something different than if you have to put it into one big, uh, let's say, power plant. On the regulatory side, let me add that there's a coordination challenge, let's say, between transmission and distribution. GANA will follow up on this, but also between aggregators and system operators. And last but not least, I would say there's also, let's say, um, a challenge of, of robust baseline act, um, estimation. I think you guys from the US know this is this is hard. Remember the Baltimore baseball stadium, which was turning on stadium lights during electricity shortages in order to be paid to shut them off, right? Overall, we think that these are hard problems and that innovation is required to overcome these, these barriers. Let me give you a concrete example of, of this uh, innovation. And let me do this by taking off the hat of the association NCOE and, and put on my corporate hat of, of Terna to talk about Equigy. Uh, Equigy is a crowd balancing platform. Um, together with the Dutch, German, Swiss, and Austrian TSO, we have launched a joint venture last year, and we intend to develop with what our Dutch colleagues typically call a crowd balancing platform. In other words, a platform that enables even small scale distributed resources to participate in the grid balancing process. When we pitched this to car manufacturers, they were excited. They tend to think globally and they are really not interested in yet another pilot project of a local grid operator testing how a single electric car can be used to stabilize his local grid. They are looking for a standard, at least a European one. Ideally, I think a global one, but even European is good because as you remember, uh, Europe has a population of 400, 450 million people, um, about 300,000 passion passenger cars, that is huge. But of course you would lose this advantage if you accept the fragmentation uh, between national or regional standards. So that's why we, we started off this collaboration between Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and the Netherlands. So what are we actually doing here? Um, talking a bit about the ecosystem. At the core of our platform is a blockchain because we are convinced that the necessary coordination is complex, will require a lot of data exchange between the actors and last but not least, trust. Let me give you a glimpse of, of two use cases um, that, that we are designing. So this blockchain will enable to give you a, a dynamic register or catalog of flexible devices. So where are they located? What can they do? and whether there are uh, limits to their usage. An example could be a traffic light system. So a distribution network operator might impose a red light to EVs in a certain district, flagging that these devices should not be used for, for national grid balancing in a certain moment of time. It can thus solve the coordination problem between TSOs and DSOs. The information is available and it's trusted. Second use case of which I would add is uh, that the blockchain adds a transparent and efficient way of, of doing microtransactions. Imagine that as a system operator, I need 10 megawatt of flexibility for an hour. That means that the aggregator will need to dispatch tens of thousands of vehicles every 50 minutes, right? So he will end up with probably a million transactions to deliver the required flexibility. The blockchain solution give every stakeholder across the value chain a trusted data layer because it records the transactions and by definition of a blockchain, it ensures that the past transactions are immutable. So this tracking, tracing, this trust is fundamental. So personally, I'm, I'm thrilled about this and uh, we are convinced that Equity offers a solution to many entry barriers that demand side flexibility, at least the explicit one has at the moment. And with this, I would hand over to, to Ram. Thanks all. Hi, Fabio. Thank you very much. Um, 
we will go to Gerda and then we will have uh, a question, it's a Q&A session. Um, Gerda, please. Uh, yes, Ram, thank you very much. Start. So my name is Gerd Jung. I am working in the Netherlands uh, for Tenet, which is the, the transmission system operator in both the Netherlands and part of Germany. Uh, also here on behalf of NSOE uh, as Fabio, um, so the association of all the, the TSOs in, in Europe working together uh, on several topics. So we start with the first slide. I show you a little bit of, um, of what's happening within Europe. So we have uh, worked in the past years mostly on the TSO-TSO cooperation, uh, so on the national uh, horizontal level. But we see now that uh, we need to focus more on the local uh, level as well. Uh, and of course, the European level, we've been working a lot on that uh, in the past years. But we see that now we need to focus a bit more on the vertical integration uh, between transmission and distribution. Um, we call it TSOs and DSOs. Uh, in your case, it's most, uh, mostly talking about transmission and distribution utilities. Um, but just to show you a little bit of what's been going on in Europe in the, in the past uh, years on this TSO DSO integration, um, I will show you on the next slide that we have a toolbox um, where we really focus on the different tools that we have as system operators uh, to manage the grid and to make sure that we, we keep the, the system stable. So we have technical solutions. Um, we've been discussing this before. I mean, many things are, are there. Uh, connection agreements, we can, we can work a little bit on that. Uh, tariffs uh, can also help us to ensure that, um, that we have the, the right um, electricity uh, in the right place. But the main focus that we wanted to discuss between TSOs and DSOs in, in Europe is the, the market-based solutions uh, for the, ex the activation of explicit flexibility as Fabio just, uh, just explained. Um, in the next slide, I'll show you a little bit on how this works. Uh, we've been focusing on congestion management in uh, combination um, with balancing, uh, where we will show the process of how a flexibility service provider, as we call it, so any provider uh, of flexibility, how they can participate in, uh, in a market for congestion management for TSO and DSO and for uh, possibly uh, balancing. Uh, main focus was on congestion management because it's something that both the TSO and the DSO need. Um, and it's very important to, to focus on this uh, pre-qualification, as you can see here on the left side. Uh, pre-qualification is both on the product side, so can the asset actually deliver uh, what, it's, uh, what it's trying to bid in for? Uh, and the grid pre-qualification, which is focusing on can the grid uh, bring the electricity from A to B? If uh, the flexibility service provider is pre-qualified, then they can bid into a market uh, which has coordination schemes uh, for TSOs and DSOs to, to interact proper, properly. So what happens there in this, that market coordination scheme? Um, TSOs and DSOs both give information about their grid, uh, any restrictions that they might have. Um, and there is one system operator that actually requires to solve any congestion. So, you have a bid that could solve your congestion, but you also want to ensure that it doesn't create any congestion in uh, adjacent grids. So that's what this market coordination scheme is for. There are three main options. We described it also in a report that was published in uh, 2019. You can see the link here um, uh, in case you want to uh, look at the report. Um, and these three options are basically you uh, you separate balancing from congestion management of the TSO and from the congestion management of the DSO. So you have basically three separate markets. Um, you can also combine the congestion management of the TSO and DSO and keep the balancing apart, or you can take all three together and really focus on the integration of balancing and congestion management of both the transmission and distribution level. So what happens further, you go to the product activation only if you find a bit that can help uh, resolve your congestion and not cause any congestions anywhere else. Uh, in case that happens, you can activate the product and make sure that the FSP, the flexibility service provider is, um, is informed uh, so it can actually deliver and uh, it can properly uh, be settled as well. So <clears throat> from this, you can see that it's very important to uh, work together between TSOs and DSOs to ensure that uh, any resolving uh, any congestion doesn't cause any new congestions. 
And that's what I will uh, describe a little bit in the next slide, uh, which basically shows the vision that we have. Uh, we work in one system. So we look at the system at large and not at uh, parts because we have different companies taking care of it. We want to work together in an integrated system approach. Um, furthermore, we want to serve customers and society. Um, that means we need to value the flexibility that they have and also give a, put a price to it. Um, but that mainly happens in, in the markets. Cooperation with the DSOs obviously is very, very important. Uh, we need to do this together. Uh, we access the same resources for uh, either the same or, or different uh, products. So we need to make sure that it's properly aligned. And of course, we need to have a, some kind of observability in each other's area to make sure that if there's any issue in, uh, in one part of the grid, um, you know in advance that it will come to the grid that you're uh, responsible for. So what do we aim for? We aim for a common vision, um, both from a TSO perspective, but also embracing the DSOs and other actors that are uh, involved in this energy system. Um, we want to have the maintain the European diversity that we have and that we uh, cherish, but also uh, ensure that we continue with this horizontal um, integration, so the cross-border integration between the different countries, um, besides the vertical integration between European uh, transmission and distribution. And of course, using the local scale opportunities, um, even though we, we frame them in a, in a global system. So we look at the system as a whole, as one system, but we still do know that we have uh, local differences. So in the next slide is a little bit more on the vision uh, of NSOE uh, and the TSO perspective on this the demand side flexibility. So what can demand side flexibility actually do? Well, it can reduce peak demand, that's something I think we all know. It can avoid, therefore, grid investments. Um, but our main focus was also on active power. So besides uh, being active in the market, mainly in day ahead and intraday, because we're going closer to real time now with many renewables in the system, um, but also by system operators, as I discussed, for congestion management and also balance. This balancing is the frequency control that we've seen in the, in the slides of Fabio before. Um, but we do need to ensure that we have proper regulation, that the policy is clear, um, that the market and the system are properly uh, designed, just to make sure that everything works together as one. As a TSO, we also procure all our um, products in a technology neutral way. That means that we don't really care in that sense um, where the product is coming from, as long as it is being delivered the way we need it. Um, that means that it's very uh, good for any actor to participate. However, we need to work on the requirements um, of these, like, let's say the product specifications to ensure that also the small participants and even aggregates uh, can participate in this. And that is something that we still need to um, work on, although several things are already in place. Um, then, very important is also the locational information because especially talking about congestion management, if you participate in a certain location where there is a restriction, that means that you will need to uh, solve this restriction and that is extra costs for society. So we need to focus on getting more locational information um, even when there is an aggregated pool. That means some kind of minimum granularity will be needed there. And of course, proper metering uh, is important to also be able to settle uh, what has actually been delivered. So not to forget that all of this, uh, we're basically looking at electricity, but the energy sector is much more than that. Um, so the way we see it, also sector coupling is very important, where we combine electricity, gas, heat, and transport. It's something that needs to be developed further, uh, something that we still need to look at. But definitely, if we only look at electricity, it will not be enough. Um, to really focus on the, on the goals we need to reach in the, in the coming years. So finally, uh, in the last slide that, we, that I can show, um, there's some kind of um, an overview of all the, the pilot projects that, we, uh, that we're doing in, in Europe. Of course, these are projects either um, under the Horizon 2020 program where the European Commission is, uh, is providing subsidies uh, it can be private pilots or it can be actual projects already 
uh, ongoing. Um, you can see a lot of things are, are happening here. Uh, they're on a local scale, national scale, and the regional scale. Uh, we also see different parties being, uh, like, let's say, the main actor involved. It can be a TSO, it can be a DSO, or a combination of the two. It can be a power exchange or a third party. And you see, it's, there's a lot going on, uh, many things that we're learning still. Uh, and I want to focus on one of the projects, which is, is GoPax, uh, which is in the Netherlands. Um, it's, let's say, a small power exchange focusing on, on intraday trade uh, on a 15 minute basis. And they gave the opportunity for any market party that wants to bid into this market um, to provide locational information. And when you do so, this locational information can be seen only by system operators. So there's no issue between market parties that they can see where uh, a bid is located. It's only been visible, made visible for system operators and they can actually uh, use these bids to solve congestions. Um, one important remark to make here is that um, you can only uh, activate spreads as they call it, uh, where you activate an upside and a down, downside bid at the same time to ensure you don't um, interfere with the, with the balancing of the, of the country. Um, this is a really ongoing project. It's not a pilot anymore. Uh, it's together uh, with the TSO and uh, the, the different DSOs that we have in the Netherlands. And uh, it's actually working already. So uh, it ensures that smaller parties can also involve in, in congestion management, which is currently running in parallel with the congestion management that we already have in place um, for years. So this a small overview of everything that's happening in Europe, and uh, I'm happy to further discuss the differences between the US and, uh, and Europe. Um, so any questions you might have, I'm happy to answer in the panel discussion. Thank you. We will now start the Q&A uh, session. And um, I wanna start with some questions that were asked in our uh, uh, Q&A screen here. Um, let me just uh, bring them up. Um, where is this here? So, so one question for um, the panel is regarding resiliency and how can uh, demand side flexibility help there and how will we uh, potentially support that with policies? So maybe uh, I'll start and that with Fabio, maybe you can first uh, take a cut at that and then Ram. Yes, I think re resilience, very important question as we also saw in, in Texas uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I think there is especially a grid resilience for infrastructure. There's a key role of, of policy um, because uh, extreme climate events will be very rare and it's difficult, let's say for a pure market perspective, to ensure the necessary invest investments. So I think prescribing standards and assuring, let's say, a, a remuneration for the investments that you're doing for resilience is key, and especially when it comes to extreme climate events, being extreme cold or extreme uh, heat waves that I think we both will be observing in the next couple of years. Very good. Um, Ram, what, what can you add in terms of the building side to that equation? Well, I mean, I think um, when we think about resiliency, right, it's uh, there's a tendency to think about it in terms of backup power. Um, that's uh, that's that's our first instinct. But also, there are things that we can do within the buildings. For example, if you have a better building shell that provides resiliency against climate um, demand response, it increases the demand response potential because now you can offset your loads for longer periods of time, do better pre-cooling, preheating, etc. So there's definitely an interplay between the two. Um, and I think it goes back to how we design. It's something that we haven't thought about from a design perspective, but as we move forward, can we actually look at uh, resiliency as part of our building design? And how do we um, incorporate that, both in our electrical system and in our building systems? Diane, can you comment a little bit on, on, on this issue from, from a policy perspective? You know, We have a decarbonization goal at the same time, we have to consider climate resiliency and adaptation. Um, you know, demand flexibility can help in both. How, how is that seen from, from a policy um, perspective? 
it's still evolving. I mean, I think again, it's it, if done right, it can be a great tool. I'm not an expert on um, Texas, but there certainly are some well-respected people who I've read about with their analyses where they said that Texas's approach, I mean, it had its whole market design, you know, not having, having a market within one state was poor planning, let's be honest. But in addition to that, while it had demand response participating, it, in my mind, it hadn't gone down to that next level, which is if we had some of the more advanced tools that we've talked about, you could have gone in and um, uh, really seen how you could use the buildings themselves, um, lowering perhaps their actual heating so that across the entire ERCOT grid, there was less of a load. But at the same time, if your electricity goes out in those buildings, they're not able to participate in any demand flexibility. So it's also a matter of timing, um, having the controls, having the automation so that you can call on it in far enough in advance. Um, real quickly here in California, sort of our part has been blackouts due to concerns about wildfires and our state regulator, um, the California Public Utilities Commission just adopted a decision a few weeks ago that did increase the amount of um, demand response um, that we hope to be able to utilize literally this summer so that we can respond if needed, if because of the wildfires, we're starting to shut off our, our um, lines and, and lessen what that happens. Um, in my mind, that's sort of a baby step. I skimmed the decision and it still was, you know, very, very, these siloed ways of looking at it. And um, I love my regulators, but I think it's time for a bigger vision, a step forward of where this can go. But there clearly is a role on the demand side for resilience. Thank you very much. Uh, changing the, uh, the, the, the direction a little bit, um, Deep uh, is the participant in the webinar, is asking the following question. What is the biggest part of the puzzle that is still unsolved? Is it the technology with respect to data or coordination? Is it policy or regulatory? Or it's more how we can unify all the parts of the puzzle to make the grid more coordinated? I wanted, Gerda, maybe you can start off um, from, from your perspective in, in Europe, um, and then others can okay. just chime in. I think there's no one single answer to this. I think it's a, it's a, it's really a puzzle. Uh, we cannot say it's only one piece missing. Um, so we need to work on, on regulation, which in Europe, for example, we're uh, now trying to, um, to prepare for a uh, new regulation on demand side response and flexibility, uh, which will bring us further into that direction. Um, but we also need to, to look at the big picture. We, we need everyone to, to play their part. Uh, we cannot just say, okay, it's all up to system operators and they have to uh, ensure it. We cannot say it's all up to demand response. Um, also, it's difficult to change people's behavior. So it needs to be automated. Uh, people need to have a, a revenue from it, otherwise they will not participate. Um, and then, I mean, what I already said, the uh, sector coupling can also be, be uh, something that we need to uh, further look at. I mean, we electrify a lot, but will that really work in the long run? We need to ensure that we have enough availability at all times. Uh, so we can basically uh, use the electricity that we want to use uh, at the moment we want to use it. Any others want to chime in? Maybe from a US perspective as well. Um, I'll say that uh, in preparing for this, I looked over a Brattle report from I think last year, and I think it concluded on the, um, uh, I think it was de demand response, not the full range of DERs, that it concluded sort of looking ahead to the great potential that we've all talked about that on the technology side, they thought that we're about halfway there of having existing technologies. So there still is a big chunk to go. Um, on the policy side, I, 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 I think we're about 5% there, quite frankly, that I um, read a, um, another analysis that said that across the United States, on average, our utilities are um, only employing about 1% of the energy efficiency that they could from their gas and electricity side. 
That's 1%. And that's for an area we've been in for 40 years. And we know the technologies, we know lighting, we know insulation. Um, and so if we're going to get this dynamic flexibility into the system, uh, we have to have, I think, a very different approach on policy. And that's what I was talking about, because otherwise we may still be 30 years from now. Great. We have about 5% of our load participating, and that's not going to cut it. Fab, Fabio, uh, sorry, Ram, please go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna, uh, just one quick thing I wanted to add is um, the con consumer customer perspective, right? I think we think that there's a lot of resources out there. Um, but how much of the resources is a customer actually going to be willing to participate in the markets, right? We, we tend to think of it from a very technical potential capability perspective saying, hey, there's, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 million heat pumps. Hey, they're all going to be flexible. But do we actually have the construct for the customer to make it happen? So I think that's something we'll have to think about. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, do we need a policy pusher, let's say politics deciding that you have to participate in because honestly i mean at least me personally um i don't think that everyone wants to participate because they just want to use electricity as as they do today um and maybe they will participate if there's a big revenue but i mean they don't want to feel it in their in their daily life and and another huge concern from policymakers and the public is going to be privacy um that you're talking about literally getting information about how you know usages go on in in the buildings and there's the technical answer don't worry we've got it covered which i think is actually true but um whether regulators and policymakers are willing to depend upon the technologists for what they view as a lot of untried if you're talking about thousands of um, homes and their usages and businesses potentially being exposed. So I think the um, privacy and the data concerns are huge from the policy um, maker's perspective. I wanted to add uh, another Fa perspective. Fabio. Yeah, I wanted to add another yeah. perspective on, uh, on this. Um, I think I agree, technological progress has been has been significant, impressive, um, but I would also say some things do not change fundamentally. A washing machine remains a very inexpensive uh, device. And so thinking that someday we will put on uh, remote control uh, <laughs> capability and uh, real-time telemetry is only so that a washing machine can provide frequency control services to the system operator, I highly doubt this, right? Because the extra cost is, uh, is so high with respect to the, the benefit that uh, a washing machine owner can, can achieve from that. I think we also need to accept that uh, the more, more prestigious grid services will be covered probably by uh, assets which are more expensive like electric vehicles, right? And here, because most of the, the things, most of the technology comes out of the box, the intelligent meter, the remote control software, the capability, all these things, they come out of the box when you buy an electric vehicle. Wow, it's, it's better than any kind of computer. It's, it's really, it's amazing. And uh, we need to make sure that from a regulation perspective, we can make use of them, even if they are behind the, the let's say the, the fiscal meter, which might be stupid, but you have a very intelligent device behind it. Yeah, so how can we make sure that it is possible to use it? This is a, a regulatory question. And, and, um, and on top of that, let's say the you have the, the trust, of course, the complexity, the coordination. And, and here, I think you have the, the blockchain approach. Probably there will be other approaches. But I would say this, this remains important, that putting the puzzle, all pieces of puzzle together remains challenging. I would say there's not a single solution yet. So, and, so this, this kind of uh, uh, connects nicely to this uh, question of, you know, uh, Terry Oliver asked about business model implications. And hearing the story here, you know, this new modalities of flexibility will create new opportunities. Um, are these opportunities going to be significant? Are there gonna be new players? Are still things gonna be carried out by existing utilities? What's kind of the picture of the future um, that you see? And maybe we could start with uh, Diane um, on that. Um, well, traditionally, the discussion in the United States on business models in the last decade has been um, because we, from the regulated utility, um, 
Should we move our regulated utilities off of cost of service to performance-based rate making where you're getting um, uh, incentivized or penalized based on the outcomes of certain goals set forth for you? And one of our states, Hawaii, just in December, really did the first major move of the entire utility towards this system. But it took them three years and literally millions of dollars of external stakeholder resources to make that happen. Um, that is not a replicable model in the United States for our utilities across 50 states to each have those types of resources and spend that amount of time because we'll be a decade <laughs> at best really making major changes. So um, I think we have to instead sort of reverse the way we're looking at this. And I'm not talking about the wholesale markets and especially I think in Europe where you have a lot of um, uh, RTOs and you, I guess, have also got your DSOs in place that, that can really use the markets. But in the United States, um, we don't have that level of um, structure. So I think it's sort of the reverse of if we have a goal, whether it's the federal level or state level, of we are decarbonizing our grid. <laughs> then what is the amount of demand flexibility that really can bring those costs down that can make that grid operate well, that can provide benefits? And that's what I was saying in my remarks. Um, that's the goal we need to understand and get to. And then we work our way backwards 25 years to now of what do we need sort of year by year increments as a country, and then at least in our major states and maybe some other smaller one, and then you start to get the funding. But if we, I'm very worried if we say we're gonna approach this problem the way we have everywhere else, um, we don't have that amount of time under climate to be having this discussion 10 years from now or 15 years from now. So I'm advocating on a policy side, we say, what's that end point we gotta to get to how do we work backwards? And then we literally put in the money to make it happen, which is very different from having a screen of cost effectiveness up front. Uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the picture that has been painted so far, there's kind of this implicit assumption that data seems to flow freely and openly. And we see a ton of limitations in terms of that happening in the real world today. Um, maybe Ram, can you comment a little bit on kind of from a building owner perspective, the issue of data, and then I would like to hear the same from Gerda about the perspective of DSOs, DSOs, um, Gerda and Fabio, and then Diane from a regulatory perspective. So um, we will start a little bit on the anecdotal side. So when we started our work on smart thermostats in 2013, we said, hey, you know what, we're going to run these trials, we're going to get all the data we can on every thermostat that's out there, or whatever, 20, 30,000 thermostats, pull all the data in, right? Because we didn't know what data we would need. And I think after seven or eight years, have having gone through the data journey, and by the way, the privacy laws have evolved quite a bit in the meantime too. Um, I think the most important thing is to understand what data you actually need. Yes, there's a ton of data flowing around, but too much data is not necessarily a good thing either. So the most important thing I think is figuring out how you can do the measurement and validation. Um, and that might mean that you don't need data from every one of those devices. It could be that the data flows through the aggregator or the pro market product provider with an audit chain, right? And maybe that's what is happening in Europe with Gerda and Fabio, right? But I think that's, um, we, we have to get to the point where we have to be comfortable that we don't have to reach all the way in and get every piece of data. The manufacturers, whether it's a storage manufacturer or the thermostat manufacturers, they have their agreements with the customer. We adhere to those agreements. We work with the manufacturers, create an audit trail, create a data chain, and that way we can do our m and uh, more appropriately, I think. Um, so anyway, but it's that's our experience with the data that it's uh, not, just asking for everything or too much data is not necessarily a good thing. I agree. I agree that the data overload is not uh, really what you're looking for. Um, companies, especially also system operators, they're not even able to 
deal with all that data to process it. So really focus on the aggregated data that you need. Um, only that that you actually need for your role, let's say. So we, we really focus on uh, data availability, which is uh, role dependent. Um, so you don't have any data available that you don't need. Um, and I think that's, that's also very important because otherwise you get really an overkill of data which you cannot handle. And, uh, you, you will lose the data that's actually relevant to you. Yeah, so the experience we made in Europe is I think as system operator, transmission system operator, we interface with the aggregator, but we will not ask to see what the single electric vehicle is doing. Um, I think our guys from the control room, they, they wouldn't make any use of, of this data. So it's, uh, it's let's say, uh, it's useless to try to collect it as a transmission system operator. At the same time, we need to ensure that somebody validates the single data, so to exclude fraud. And here we see a key role of maybe of the aggregator, of the distribution uh, system operator, who also typically runs the smart meter, or operates the smart meter. So somebody needs to, to do these cross checks. You could probably also do this again, uh, as I say, in a, in a blockchain, to have these automatic audits, automatic analytics. But we do not see need to see the single data. And once you exclude this, you already solve a lot of privacy issues, right? Because you send less data around from one area to another. It does not end up on Terna computers what Mario Rossi has been doing with his electric vehicle yesterday evening. So if it's not there, it's not a privacy issue. Um, at the same time, I think there's still some, let's say, uh, problems to solve if you are an electric vehicle owner. Sometimes you have to sign up a, a lot of agreements in order to share your data with the aggregator with whom you are signing a contract, right? Because he's selling you flexibility. So there's probably some things that can be simplified still. Um, but overall, I think it's, uh, it's, it's an issue that can be handled. And, and Fabio, just as a follow-up on this before hearing from Diane, I, how will you trust whether that aggregator who's collecting all those measurements from the EVs, what they're reporting to you as a reduction is an actual reduction? How do you resolve that? It refers to baseline methodology, basically, right? Um, so in this case, this is why uh, real-time telemetry is, is so important because this is, I think, the best way of, of measuring what the user would have done in absence of the dispatch command. Right, so, so you know, four seconds before the dispatch command was sent, you you know what what the user was was doing, and of course, you as a system operator, you only see the aggregate of this. This means that somebody else need to ensure needs to ensure that the measurements the single devices are sending to to the aggregator and then transmitting to the system operator are actually valid. It's an important point. Um, there are different options, of course. There is a key role for the distribution network operator because he runs the meters. So he can see if the integral, the 50 minute integral of the four second values actually match with what was measured actually with the fiscal meter. And at the same time, I think if you track all this in a blockchain and, and it means that the history is not immutable, it's, it's not mutable anymore, it can be changed, cannot be changed anymore. This is a huge layer of trust that you add to the system. Right, because gaming, sometimes you, you try to make things match ex post, but if you have sent real time the measurements, I think it's difficult, much more difficult to, to do gaming. And also work on certified metering. Yeah. So at least the meters are certified and they cannot use whatever meter they can, they can think of. That but it will also help. And Diane, what, what has been uh, kind of, you know, from a policy perspective around data, because I've seen there's a lot of obstacles on that and regulators are constantly trying to play catch up with technology on right. that domain. <laughs> well, so. I was just actually extremely pleased to hear um, all of the technical folks here tell me that uh, less data is actually what's critical and you have a good sense of what that data is and you have the abilities through blockchains or other processes to um, ensure privacy and aggregation, et cetera. So those are all great answers. Um, two thoughts come to mind. One is I mentioned before the need for education of policymakers, of regulators, of stakeholders. Um, this alone would be a whole area to embark upon, to really come very quickly um, initially talk about the data, talk about privacy, 
um, so that there is some level of education we can get up to. But the other thing that comes to mind, and I don't know enough about this really, is in the United States, we run both retail demand response programs and our um, uh, wholesale markets have demand response. And now with this new FERC order 2222 and 222A, um, the idea is to really jump shot the wholesale demand response market. And so understanding um, one area I know has been um, to avoid duplications that from participation by a customer load in both a retail program and then through aggregation and, and participation in the wholesale markets. How are we going to make sure that everybody knows what the rules are and what the data is that's provided to one program versus another program? And anytime you're talking about the retail le uh, level, you're talking about the state regulators and um, they are responsive to the public very much. They're appointed by governors. Um, they're constantly going before their legislators. So they've got to have real strong answers. Um, why is the data needed and how is it protected? And, and those, the more we can think about them up front and have documentation of what are good results, the more you're going to be able to move policy forward. I think, um... Uh, I'm going to summarize a few of the questions that are in, in the Q&A and, and formulate a question out of that. Um, both James Buchan and Mark Martin, they commented on this idea of maybe there is individual resources, large resources that are more meaningful, and uh, there is a need to protect the individual's privacy, but is there some framework where for that individual equipment, information could be shared. Would that make sense? And then James points out that, for example, in the case of a car, it's important to understand how the vehicle battery is degrading as it offers services to the grid. Um, who makes that determination? Where is that data sitting? I think that's kind of the gist of the questions. So any, anyone wants to take up these questions? Maybe on the on the battery, the, the EV battery, for example, um, the question is also how much does a customer care about all of the information? Um, it's information that maybe as a as the energy community we would like to know because then we know how much we can use it and and what is a what is really the 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 issue for the customer. But I don't think each and every customer wants to know exactly what's happening with the battery of their car. They just want to make sure that they don't have to do anything. They can use the car whenever they want. And if they can get some money for it, fine. That's super nice. But I don't think they want to. They want to see the data and really figure out themselves what's happening with the battery. Yeah, um, that, that's a. Yeah. Sorry. Please go ahead, Ram. That's okay. I'll wrap up. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. But I I, I think the point that's brought up here is. Um, degradation reduces the value of your vehicle somehow or whatever asset you're considering. And how do you mediate that between the individual, the aggregator? Uh, and of course, from a system operator, maybe that that's like one step removed. Um, so, so one of the things, right, is that, I mean, so there's an aggregator and there's a product manufacturer. Sometimes they're the one and the same, sometimes they're not. So in our retail demand response programs, for example, we have the... Uh, the nests or the ecobees being aggregators themselves of their end use devices. And one of the um, um, claimed advantages for that is that they know what the customer preferences are because they are getting the data, they're getting set points, they're getting all these things, right? Whether it's an, <laughs> even for an EV manufacturer, like BMW, I think is already doing some trials with pg e for example. They can then manage battery degradation, they can manage the customer's preferences, they know when the, when the EV is going to charge, etc. So they can actually use the data to manage the controls, and then they aggregate it from a whole bunch of these end-use devices or vehicles, and then they bring it back into the market, right? So in that way, um, you have this layer of abstraction between the grid and the aggregator, and then the manufacturer is managing the customer's preferences behind the behind the fence, uh, for lack of a better word. So I think it, it 
again, it's something that the manufacturers, the product providers, um, it's their responsibility to make sure that the customer is satisfied with the overall experience. And that, that's why I think they are very important as a participant in any kind of aggregation that happens or market participation that happens. So when I say that we don't need all kinds of data, you need the data for the controls, but you don't need the data for the grid management. The controls can be behind the manufacturer's um, side. We, we have time for one last question. And I wanted to bring up this issue of um, security. So Oli Ageson has actually observed that, you know, as you open up systems to more controllability, um, it creates not just issues around privacy, but, but also the important question of security. And depending on how you design the system, uh, maybe you can have more security if you just send a price signal and let people respond and to actually send control signals. Um, so I wanted to understand uh, maybe from starting with Diane and then uh, Fabio or Gerda, um, how does security considerations play a role in policy as well as, you know, from a system operator standpoint, you know, as you're starting to engage with these aggregators, you know, how, how do you see security as an issue for, for the system? Um, I'll say it real quick. And then I want to have one minute at the end on um, equity <laughs> and what are we going to do about low income communities? Yep. But um, when I was a commissioner and we were first rolling out our smart meters in California, I remember that we had a session for commissioners on, on security and cybersecurity. What we found out is we knew nothing of this world. So that's all I'm going to say is you cannot assume that your average regulator, at least at the state level, knows anything about security, has staff that knows anything. And this is another piece of the puzzle that has to be thought about with education, with expert resources made available. What the answer is, I don't know. But I just know the regulators don't have those resources currently. Fabio, <laughs> so anything to add there? Yeah, to, to add on this, of, of course, we have to learn on, on the way. Cybersecurity is an important topic, but say we don't have the solution. I wanted to add and say an observation of what uh, Ole was saying, that let's say implicit demand side flexibility um, is inherently easier to secure. It, yes and no, but uh, still, I would say, uh, as a system operator, you need a toolbox, which also includes explicit demand side flexibility. So you cannot just exclude this, because in the end, Let's say if things go wrongly, go badly, you need a, a last resort a way of, of intervening, let's say. And this has to include explicit demand side flexibility, especially in the system 10 years from now, 20 years from now, where there are no big power plants left, right? <laughs> Sounds scary, but this is uh, the framework we are, we are uh, evolving towards. And uh, so even if it is, or if it would be inherently more secure to, to do everything with implicit demand side flexibility, I think you cannot simply only rely on this. Very good. And to, and then maybe, to actually- Maybe yeah. on cybersecurity, also in, in Europe, we're now uh, working on a network of regulation on cybersecurity. So it's really high on the agenda as well to, to focus on. And just to kind of end our uh, webinar today, um, I, I think Diane touched a very key point, um, which uh, I also wanted to bring up, which is this issue of, of equity and access. Many of the technologies we talked about today, they're quite advanced and they can be quite expensive. How do we ensure that this uh, demand side flexibility transformation is not uh, um, limited to uh, um, just uh, those that are higher income. And uh, just to, to be before answering this question, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have a final workshop on, on grid uh, decarbonization coming up on the um, 28th of April, on reaching 80% clean electricity by 2030 to conclude our series. So a final word from each one of you on this issue of equity and access. Um, well, if I can start, because when I was a commissioner, I also oversaw the low income programs and um, it can be done, 
but it's going to be costly. Um, typically low income programs in the energy world in the United States are subsidies. They don't pass through the normal cost effectiveness screening. And you also have to think about it again, at least in the United States, our low income um, population overwhelmingly is more in multifamily buildings than in single family buildings. And multifamily buildings have all these problems under energy efficiency of um, the owner and the occupant. And those are going to be the same for this world as well. And we, didn't, we haven't done a good job of solving it, but we have to think consciously of it. And they're not necessarily going to have those EVs if they're in apartments. Um, they're not going to necessarily have a way in which the building owner is going to put in the new infrastructure so that you can have those heat pumps replaced, so that you can have um, uh, the electric water heaters. I think, you know, this again needs to be an area very carefully thought out because otherwise 10 years from now we're going to say, oh, guess who's participating in these programs? It's, you know, the middle income and, and higher. And I don't know that you're going to get as much participation, but that sure tells you you're going to have political pushback if the lower income customers are the ones paying for a lot of these costs. So it's tough. We haven't done a good job necessarily on the low income side, but the sooner we get started and make it a goal, I think the sooner we can start to get some answers. But it's going to cost money. It's going to be more expensive to make this an inclusive of low income participants than if we just ignored it. But in the long run, it's going to make it sustainable, I think. Great. Um, any comments from, from the others or final words? Um, I agree with Diane. I think it's a big issue. Uh, it's, it's an area of focus, I wouldn't call it a big issue, but I think um, we should probably also look at non device based responses like behavioral that can be um, aligned to affordable housing communities. Okay, okay everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, the panelists. This was super exciting and uh, lots of things to, to think about. Um, and I, I believe demand flexibility will be a key component of any decarbonization solution. We have to figure that, this out quickly. Um, so looking forward to the last seminar in the series on April 28th um, with uh, Arun Majumdar and Sally Benson discussing our path to clean, 100 percent clean electricity. So how do we go beyond 80 percent, which is a huge challenge. Um, thank you, everyone. See you next time. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.